this is Tom Fox. I would like to welcome you to a five-part conversation with K2 Intelligence Finn on navigating an increasingly complex sanctions landscape. This podcast series is sponsored by K2 Intelligence Finn. In this conversation, I'm joined by Adam Frey. Adam is a managing director at K2 Intelligence Finn, working across both financial crimes, risk, and compliance, investigations, and disputes practices. As a key member of the firm's independent consultant team, at the direction of federal, state, and international regulators, he works to monitor and assess global financial institutions' compliance with AML and OFAC enforcement actions and related consent orders. Frey helps K2 Finn's intelligence reviews of institutions, BSA, and AML sanctions programs. He helps clients mitigate risk associated with litigation, alleged misconduct, to ensure their anti-corruption and international financial sanctions policies and procedures. Also, Eric Lorber, who is the vice president at K2 Intelligence Finn, where he advises global financial institutions on issues related to sanctions and AML and combating financing for the terrorist compliance. Prior to joining K2 Intelligence, Fannie was senior advisor to the Undersecretary of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence at the U.S. Department of Treasury, where he provided strategic guidance on U.S. sanctions, AML, and CFT policies. He's previously worked at Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher, where he advised clients on the areas of international trade and compliance. In this series, we will take a look at the current landscape. In episode two, building sanctions into your compliance program. Three, so you think you violated a sanctions breach, what happens next? Four, a new exposure for corporates and shipping space. And conclude with what's down the road. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and welcome to In Conversation with K2 Intelligence Finn, navigating an increasingly complex sanctions landscape. Today, I have with me Eric Lorber, and we're going to visit about the current sanctions landscape. So, Eric, first of all, welcome, and thank you for taking the time to visit with me. Thanks so much, Tom. It's great to be on the the podcast with you. Eric, I think one of the things that many compliance uh, specialists or officers and even specialists really have uh, struggle with is getting their arms around the term of sanctions. It can be uh, many things to many people. It can be very dynamic. Uh, but I was wondering if you could maybe start with taking us through the different kinds of sanctions. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, in, in some ways, it's it highlights a, a key issue, which is that the term sanctions is really thrown about, um, but oftentimes it means various things, different things. And so when I think about sanctions, sort of at a broad level, what I think about is a prohibition on doing business with a particular entity um, or or jurisdiction. But within that, I think there are all sorts of different types of sanctions. And I like to think about basically five different sort of core types. Um, The first type uh, are, are sort of what are best known sort of the comprehensive jurisdictional sanctions. So here you have the prohibitions um, on doing business with a with a jurisdiction. Think of the U.S. Um, the U.S. sanctions program related to Iran um, or North Korea or Syria. And the language and the construct of these sanctions is fairly s- simple. It's essentially. If you're, in the case of the United States, a U.S. person, you cannot do business um, with individuals or entities who are ordinarily resident in these jurisdictions. Um, The second set of uh, of sanctions, which I think are useful to discuss, are the list-based or conduct-based sanctions. And these are what people generally think of when they think of sort of, quote-unquote, targeted or smart sanctions. Here, the sanctions restrictions apply specifically to individuals or companies um, who are engaged in bad activity, right? And so the best example you can think of on this one um, would be something like the U.S. program, uh, the U.S. Kingpin Act, which is the um, the, the counter-narcotics trafficking program that the United States has put into place. So other programs that are related are um, uh, proliferation um, sanctions programs and uh, terrorism uh, sanctions programs, but they're specific list-based programs. The third um, set of sanctions are what I like to think of as the regime-based sanctions programs. So here it still is a list-based program, but it's targeted at specific uh, regimes. So for example, the US program on Zimbabwe um, is, uh, is kind of what we like to think of where 
particular political um, uh, individuals, um, officers of a government are targeted because of their affiliation uh, with that government. Then there are two more. So the fourth are, are what we now refer to as quote unquote sectoral sanctions. And sectoral sanctions, as many of the listeners I'm sure know, really sort of began or were developed in the context of the Ukraine sanctions program in 2014. And they were meant to solve a policy problem that at the time the Obama administration faced. And the policy problem was as follows. Uh, the administration at the time wanted to forcefully respond to um, Russia's efforts um, to annex Ukraine, uh, sorry, Crimea in Ukraine, as well as destabilize Eastern Ukraine. However, um, there was uh, certainly a concern that a traditional list-based sanctions program against some of the largest Russian companies that, uh, that the U.S. wanted to target would have very serious uh, blowback impacts, collateral consequences, right? Particularly for Western Europe, but also for uh, for U.S. companies as well. So what what the Obama administration came up with was this idea of sectoral sanctions, and essentially they are res particular transaction restrictions on sectors um, of a particular uh, target target country's economy. So in the Russia context, right, you have um, restrictions on the issuance of new debt or equity over a certain tenor uh, in, the, in the case of debt for particular Russian uh, companies in the defense, energy, um, and financial sectors. So again, these, sa these sanctions were really designed as a way to sort of thread this policy needle of, of being, you know, giving a forceful response, but not too forceful. And then the fifth and final category of sanctions, I think, um, which is the, probably the most, uh, I'll say the most controversial are the secondary sanctions. And like sectoral sanctions, secondary sanctions were also developed to solve a policy problem. The policy problem was the United States could impose you know, substantial jurisdictional sanctions, for example, on Iran. However, if there was no U.S. jurisdiction, um, third-party companies uh, in, in third-party countries, say in Europe or, or in East Asia, could continue to do business with Iran. And that would substantially undermine the, um, the economic impact of the U.S. sanctions program. So what the U.S. came up with was this idea of secondary sanctions. Essentially, what secondary sanctions are, are they are sanctions restrictions that apply even when there's no U.S. jurisdiction. And the way they work is essentially the U.S. says, European bank or, or Chinese company, you can do business with Iran if you want. That is your legal, um, that is your legal right to do so. But if you do that, then you will lose access to U.S. markets in a variety of ways. And they're, they're very controversial because many who, uh, who are in these sort of third party uh, countries think of them as extraterritorial. But nevertheless, they have proven very impactful. Um, I think, you know, there's been some substantial evidence that the secondary sanctions uh, regime on Iran and, and on North Korea um, and, uh, and now on, on Syria, just, just created recently on Syria, are having a fairly substantial economic impact on those jurisdictions. Eric, how did sanctions become such an important uh, economic tool? Yeah, so um, so they really, you know, again, there's this kind of um, uh, quip or adage that has developed in policy circles in Washington, D.C., that sanctions really are the tool of first resort. Um, they are sort of the go-to tool uh, that the U.S. government in particular uses now Um uh, when uh, when faced with a foreign policy challenge or a foreign policy crisis, and I think there are um, I think there are sort of three reasons for that, uh, Tom. The first reason is I think there's good evidence that they can have a, a substantial impact. So, with a you know a comprehensive type of sanctions program meant to sort of you know increase macroeconomic pressure on a target economy, you know you have seen situations where not only is there real economic impact, like in the case of Iran, but there's also a policy impact, right? So um, uh, in, in, uh, in the case of Iran, there's the argument, I think it's pretty credible that Iran came to the negotiating table to negotiate the joint comprehensive plan of action because of the economic pressure that the United States, uh, along with Europeans, put on it. So there is this sort of sense of, hey, these things, they can actually work, certainly with the comprehensive uh, sanctions. 
in addition, um, I think there's a sense that they can work in a targeted fashion too. I mean, there are a number of instances that, that we've seen over the last few years where specific sanctions designations, you know, the designation of a particular individual or entity um, has, for example, uh, disrupted that networks, if it's an illicit finance network, for example's ability to move um, hard currency. You saw this with Iran related designations in sort of May to, to October of 2018, where um, according to the US Treasury Department, a lot of money was disrupted. Um, from going to the Iranian regime. So I do think that, you know, there's a sense of, hey, these things, they, they actually, they do work. They can be impactful. Um, the second point, I think, um, as to why they've become so popular is, you know, think about this from the mind of a policymaker. You have a set of policy options. And sometimes sanctions are not a great tool. However, you have to compare them to other tools that you have in your toolbox or your toolkit. So if it's a question of, okay, well, you know, a strongly worded demarche, the imposition of economic sanctions, sorry, a demarche, like a letter to a foreign government, um, uh, the imposition of economic sanctions or the use of military force, say that sanctions only have maybe in your estimation, a 30% chance of being successful, but you know, a demarche has 0% chance and military force may have a higher percent change, but will also lead to, to you know, putting US, uh, US servicemen, um, putting their lives at risk. Well, then oftentimes sanctions can look like um, really the most appealing option. And I think that's part of the reason that, uh, that, that they are imposed. In addition to that, they're also fast, right? Like you can write an executive order, and we did this when I was in government. You can write an executive order pretty quickly or issue a sanctions designation fairly quickly. So it's a tool that can be implemented in an expedited or an expeditious manner. And then third, I think the third reason um, that they've become such an economic, uh, important tool is that in some ways, um, the compliance ecosystem um, has a bit of a feedback loop um, that builds on itself. What do I mean by that? So. Over the last 15 or 20 years, you, you've seen really financial institutions in particular subject to um, enforcement activity by the Office of Foreign Asset Control in the United States, OFAC. And as a result of that, um, most financial institutions, large ones anyway, um, really have invested quite a bit of money and quite a bit of resources into beefing up their sanctions compliance programs. As a result, when new sanctions designations uh, come out or new executive orders are issued, um, those financial institutions are in many ways better able to really detect dis and disrupt any illicit activity associated with that new action that, that occurs. So as these programs have become more mature, the sanctions themselves have actually become more effective and impactful because of the fact that once issued, banks know how to sort of implement them very quickly and effectively. So I think those are sort of the big three reasons why I think sanctions really have become a tool of, of choice um, uh, in the last, you know, in the last in decade or so. Eric, one of the things that has intrigued me about uh, sanctions is the breadth and scope of business sectors, industries, uh, and groups that they have impacted. Obviously, uh, banking and financial institutions are primary uh, recipients uh, or, or, or subjects of sanctions. But I'm in Houston, the self-professed energy capital of the world, and that's something that people down here really think about every day now. Um, and there are many other sector, uh, sectors, manufacturing, agricultural, tech, uh, a wide variety of sectors impacted by sanctions. I almost am reluctant to ask uh, what is the sector with the highest impact, but maybe if you could detail some of the sectors that either you advise or, or you talk about the most or talk to the most around sanctions. Yeah, that's, it's a great question, Tom. And I think you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, historically, right, it's been financial institutions. They have been sort of the, the sector that is most uh, sort of under scrutiny for sanctions, um, for, for potential sanctions violations and for their compliance programs. And that's not by accident, right? So the Treasury, uh, the US Treasury Department, in fact, um, had a very clear rationale for why they, they pushed for financial institutions to beef up their compliance programs 
um, and to be particularly focused on sanctions. And that's because they saw financial institutions as essentially gatekeepers to international commerce, right? If you want to do international commerce, you sort of need a bank account to do so. And so if you're a, a, an Iranian actor or a North Korean actor and, and you want to sort of engage in, in you know, procuring revenue for, um, for you know, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps or the Kim regime, for a long time, you needed a bank account to do so, or at least it was you know, the, the, the path of least resistance to do so. So by focusing um, on sanctions compliance in the core, uh, sorry, in the financial institution sector, Treasury was able to effectively deputize financial institutions to say, you guys go out and be our eyes and ears and disrupt this activity. And if you don't, um, you know, we'll come at you with an enforcement action or, or a penalty. But to your point, that has been changing substantially um, in recent years, and certainly, I think, frankly, in the last year and a half, where Treasury and other U.S. authorities, enforcement and regulatory authorities, have really broadened that aperture. But they're looking for that same kind of gatekeeper function. So two areas, the sectors where we are seeing really increased focus on sanctions compliance right now are in the insurance sectors. Um, and in the shipping sectors. And I know we'll talk about this in a later, um, a later episode of this podcast, but in particular in insurance and shipping, um, they have been sort of described, those sectors have been described in that same kind of gatekeeper function. You know, think about shipping, right? If you're doing international commerce, um, you know, you, you probably have to use some type of, of shipping, um, uh, you know, there's some mechanism for shipping that you're using to get your product from point A to point B. And that creates something um, of, a, of a choke point where the U.S. government is saying, OK, those who are sort of operating in this space and, and are the choke point, you have increased obligations to make sure that there's no sanctioned activity uh, that's running through you know, your shipping lines, that's um, cargo on your ships. If you're an insurance company or a financial institution, uh, that um, that you know that you're not insuring or providing financial services to that type of activity. So you've really seen an expansion in the last year and a half beyond the financial institution space. So as I, as I was mentioning, I think shipping um, in particular has really taken on this this similar type um, of gatekeeper function. I think that's how U.S. enforcement and regulatory authorities think about it, Tom. So you've got shipping, you've got insurance in addition to the to the financial institution space. And, you know, it makes some sense, right? I, I think we'll talk about this uh, uh, during a later episode of this podcast. Um, but essentially, if you want to engage in international commerce, well, you need a way to ship your goods from point A to point B. And what OFAC um, and, and other U.S. enforcement uh, and regulatory agencies have essentially said is, well, you know, those who are sitting in that gatekeeping function in the shipping space, financial institutions, insurance companies, shipping companies, um, port operators, they have uh, enhanced expectations and, you know, enhanced soft obligations for um, for disrupting any uh, sanctionable activity that's sort of going through the international uh, uh, streams of commerce. So I think what you've seen really in the last year and a half is this sort of fairly substantial shift um, from the financial institution focus of sanctions uh, to the corporate sectors, but in addition, or more particularly, to the shipping sectors and the insurance sectors. Unfortunately, Eric, we are near the end of our time, but I hope our listeners can uh, join us tomorrow for our next episode on building sanctions into a compliance program. I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks so much, Tom. Looking forward to it. Hope you've enjoyed this podcast episode in conversation with K2 Intelligence Finn on navigating an increasingly complex sanctions landscape with Adam Frey, Managing Director at K2 Intelligence Finn, and Eric Lorber, Vice President at K2 Intelligence Finn. This five-part podcast series was a special production of the Compliance Podcast Network, sponsored by K2 Intelligence Finn.